are online. So hello everybody, we're coming in here. It is this first day of March, which has already been a rainy day, so we know it's March because it starts off right with rain. But anyways, <laughs> we are going to go ahead here, and as I stated back last week, our goal is to still complete up to the presence with Lincoln, and then we're going to take a break and get on some other topics finally, just because of how things didn't go as planned last year. So I just wanted to catch up with these. So as we head into March here, we're just going ahead and we're continuing along the presence. We have just three more to cover before Lincoln, and I'm going to try to get all three of them done this week. If not, what we'll have done is we'll have two of them done. And that last one would be next week, along with the big video on Lincoln, which is going to be one of our longer ones. So that is what we're planning to do right now. <laughs> so for today, we are covering, last week we covered Zachary Taylor, who was our 12th president and the second one to die in office. Today, we're picking up from Taylor's unprecedented death, and we're picking up today with the 13th president of the United States, Another one of these very lesser-known figures, Millard Fillmore. Yes, I know. This name is very odd. Millard. I don't know anyone. I don't think I've known anyone named Millard. He's the only guy I know that has that name. <laughs> but this is for the 13th president. Now, as we may recall, Fillmore was Taylor's vice president. So, of course, upon Taylor's unprecedented death, Fillmore automatically is assuming the office of the presidency. So, and as I stated in the last video, what we're going to start seeing here is we're going to, during the 1850s, as we're now going through the 1850s, this is really the decade that the Civil War, the pretext of it is really set. And in some ways, some historians argue it started, but we will discuss that one with the 14th president as to when that supposedly could have started much earlier than 1861. But during the 1850s, this is where we start seeing the bitter debate between the South and the North over slavery. It really doesn't subside. It actually intensifies and it just gets worse and worse. Gasoline gets gets gasoline keeps getting poured on the fire. And it's not going down. It's not extinguishing. And eventually, by the very start of the 1860s, with the election of 1860, the Civil War is pretty much right on the doorstep. So starting with these next few presidents, we really see a lack of leadership in the political in the office of the presidency. Now, Fillmore wasn't really a lack of leadership. His case was just he miscalculated, and he w wasn't really knowledgeable of what the true feelings were of the country. The next two presidents after him are really really ineffective and in some and very much they're considered pretty much the bottom two worst presidents we've had of the US. They're down there with people like Donald Trump and some historians uh rankings. But they pretty much are down there. They're probably the only two that I would rank lower than Trump because they literally sat aside and did absolutely nothing. But at times, depending on my view, I also classify Donald Trump as the worst, but that's for because of many reasons. <laughs> Especially one that happened on January 6th of 2021. So, it's iffy. But nonetheless, these presidents, very low ranking on the presidential scale. Mostly because they sit there and do nothing or they agitate the issue further. Than as the country spirals down this tube to civil war. So, what we'll do here, as always, go for the biography and then go for the presidency. Now, Millard Fillmore is the first president, I believe, to be born in the 19th century. He is the first president born in the 1800s. He was born on January 7th of 1800 in Cuyahoga, in Cuyahoga County, New York, in a log cabin, ironically. He was one of the, log, the fabled log cabin presidents. However, as Fillmore grows up, he doesn't really receive much of an ed education as his family is very, very poor. They're in poverty when he's born, and they pretty much have to try to make every scrap of living that they can. Any scrap of money that the family can make, they have to get food, work on the, work on the cabin, get, can make sure that's, you know, a suitable living place <laughs> and not falling apart at the seams. His family was very poor when he was growing up, and because of this, he really didn't receive that much of a formal education. He didn't go to grade school. He didn't even attend kindergarten through eighth, and back then there was no eight. There was no kindergarten back then. 
back then it was mostly first through eighth, and that was it. There was no high school either. Now, during his youth, one of the few things that Fillmore did to try to help raise money initially for his family and then eventually for himself as he really starts to work set out on his own is he became apprentice to a wool carter, which worked with wool from sheep. And this was while he was a teenager still living at home. Eventually, after he moves out, he begins working in a law office, which is, at the time, initially for money. But as he, the longer that he works in the law office, Fillmore kind of gets a taste for practicing law. He gets a taste for even politics, in a way, through law. A lot of, the, a lot of people that go into law get a taste for politics. In 1823, Fillmore is admitted to the New York bar after studying to become a lawyer after working at the law office for several years. So this is when he's 23 years old. This is very easy for his age because he's born in 1800. So 1823, he's 23 years old. Now, in 1826, about three years into his career as a lawyer, he marries Abigail Powers, who had been his teacher at age 19, and he had courted her for several years in a basically boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, but he had refused to marry until he was older and had established his law practice. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's a little odd. He married his teacher. Well, keep in mind here, and I will mention that Abigail was born in 1798, so technically she was only two years older than Fit Millard. It wasn't like, it wasn't like a eighth grader fell in love with their teacher, and then when they got old enough, they married that teacher. It was not that, it was not like that. It, they were relatively close in age, and Fillmore was really only in school because he had chosen to be on his own accord because he had received very little education in the first place. And Abigail was a school teacher. She just happened to have had gotten him in her class, and he, of course, was the oldest student. It was very odd to have a 19-year-old in a classroom. Now, in 18... Now, him and Abigail, they never ended up having children, but they had a very long and prosperous marriage. They were married from 18... 26 until Abigail's death in 1853, just about 26 days after they left the White House. Now, in 1828, Fillmore leaves his law office practice to begin his modest and professional political career, and he starts this as a member of the Anti-Masonic Party, which is a third party, third ranked party in the United States at that time. It's not one of the two major ones. And the anti-Masonic party was built on democratic, libertarian principles, but the main thing that sets it out and gives it its name is that it was very much opposed to exclusive societies where certain high-ranking people could get benefits and be part of these inner circles that the common man could not. For example, the Freemasons or the anti-Masonic. They didn't like Fillmore and the anti-Masonic party hated the Freemasons because it was like an exclusive inner ring. They accused them that they could be traitors. They could be, they could be conspir conspiring against the government, and you wouldn't know. It was very much this phobia of secular secret societies. Now, Fillmore was elected in 1828 to the state assembly as an anti-Masonic party member, where during his time in the New York State Assembly, he becomes a very close ally of political boss Thurlow Weed, who is a very big newspaper and political boss, newspaper editor and political boss in New York at that time. And Weed kind of becomes Fillmore's main ally during his political career, at least during the early part of it. He really supports him for whatever he runs for. And he's, for instance, when he runs for the U.S. House of Representatives in 1831, Weed is right there to support Fillmore. And Fillmore gets the seat in 1831. And when Weed, who becomes kind of leads the anti-Mason party, he's kind of their leader. And he kind of joins them with the newly founded Whig Party. He conjoins them with that party as he sees that they share enough similarities that we'll just go ahead and join the Whigs. When Weed takes the whole anti-Masonic party into the Whig Party in 1834, Fillmore, of course, goes along with it. He doesn't drop out of the party. He follows Weed's lead. Now, Fillmore ends up serving four terms in Congress during his congressional career, starting with his initial election in 1831, was elected to the House, but he refused to run again when 1843 came. He basically said, okay, 
I've had enough, I don't want to run anymore, it's some time for someone else. And he basically, he drops out of the, he basically says, I'm not running for re-election. Now, Weed tries to entice Fillmore to run for governor of New York in 1844, of which Fillmore does run for. Unfortunately for him, he does not win that seat. He does lose the election in 1844 for New York governor. In 1846, while practicing, once again returning to his home life in Buffalo, New York, and practicing his law practice, Fillmore becomes a founding member of the University of Buffalo which is still a reputable, reputable New York college today. So if anyone ever sees this, that you can go to Buff the University of Buffalo up in New York, you can count the 13th president of the United States among one of your co college's founders. In 1848, Fillmore was selected as a dark horse candidate for Whig presidential nominee Zachary Taylor, who we discussed in the last video, who was our 12th president. He is nominated as the vice president nominee for Taylor, partly as a balancing act. Keep in mind, as we may recall from the last one, Taylor was a Southerner. He was originally he was from Louisiana. He was the Mexican War general. He was this hero to many Americans, and he was kind of very grudgingly agreed to run. Now, keep in mind, because of his Southern background, Taylor wasn't all that popular in the North. And even though he somewhat opposed the expansion of slavery, Northerners could not get over the factor that, A, he was a Southerner, and B, he still had slaves. They still couldn't get over that. And because of that, the Whigs knew that if they nominated Taylor, they would need, for their vice presidential candidate to go with Taylor, they would need someone to try to balance that ticket to gain voters in the North, to gain the support of voters in the North. You couldn't just win an election by getting the South. You had to try to draw voters from both regions of the country. So Fillmore is put on there as this balancing act because he's very popular with northern businessmen who very much support Fillmore and his endeavors. He, he supports the northern businesses. And Fillmore is not exactly an ab... He's not a radical abolitionist. He's not an abolitionist in any form. But he does not support slavery which appeases many of the Northerners. Now, as we all know, in 1848, Taylor ends up winning the election that year. And again, here's the electoral map. Against Taylor and Fillmore, the, Democrat, the Whig ticket won the election against the Democrats under Lewis, with Lewis Cass as their presidential nominee in 1848. So this brings them pretty much into power. Now, Fillmore, keep in mind, he's vice president, and he has to perform the duties of the vice president, which at the time really wasn't all that much. One of the bright lights that T Fillmore even got to participate in was he got to preside over the Senate because he had nothing else to do. <laughs> Unlike today, where the vice president has quite a bit of work just like the president does. In 1850, the Compromise of 1850 comes up in Congress to try to quell the slavery debate issue that is erupting over the newly acquired territories in the West and the admission of California as a possible free state. Fillmore, of course, as president of the Senate in his role as vice president, he presides over the Senate during the debates on the Compromise. And he basically sits in there and listens as Senator Henry Clay and Daniel Webster try to argue and convince the Senate, at least, that we need to adopt this compromise. If we don't, we risk tearing the Union apart. Some middle ground has to be found, and this compromise is that middle ground. Fillmore was persuaded by Clay and Webster, and even Calhoun, who was still alive at that time. He was persuaded that the compromise would stabilize the nation that it would act as a problem solver for the time being. It would bring balance to the nation and end the conflict and avoid a war. Taylor, who we may recall, he did not like it at all. He viewed that it was giving too much into the Southerners. He was, ex he was basically opposed to the fugitive slave law in it that it contained that required, that allowed federal troops to be used to recapture runaway slaves. Taylor did not like this. And he told Congress from the outset that if that compromise passes Congress and reaches my desk, I will veto it. 
No more who was privately a supporter of the compromise, I privately told Taylor on one occasion that if it comes to a tie vote in the Senate, in that case, as we may know for the U.S. Constitution, the vice president is the president of the Senate. But the vice president cannot vote in the Senate unless it, in the event of a tie. If a tie occurs, the vice president gets to hold, cast a vote. Fillmore warned Taylor, that if, it were to if the compromise were to come to a tie in the Senate, a 50-50 vote in the Senate, well, not 50, well, yeah, 50-50 would be half. I mean, it wasn't 50 senators. It wasn't like 100 senators in there back then because we didn't have 50 states, but it still would have been half. If it was an even 50-50 vote in the Senate, Taylor would vote in favor of the compromise if it came to a tie. This, of course, did not set him on good terms with Taylor. Taylor basically was a rage with Fillmore. He kind of kept him out of cabinet meetings. And the cabinet members of Taylor's presidency were kind of also the ones advising him not to accept the compromise if it came to his desk. And Fillmore resented Taylor for this, for kind of kicking him out of the cabinet meetings and everything else, simply for making his opinion known. Then the unexpected death comes. Fillmore was not really alerted to the seriousness of President Taylor's illness, after July 4th, when he got sick with the whatever stomach ailment that he had, and his death really came as kind of a shock to Fillmore because he had only recently found out just how serious Taylor's condition had been. Now, Fillmore was in Washington. He, he rushed back to Washington, and he was at Taylor's bedside with the rest of the cabinet when Taylor unfortunately passed away. And it kind of shocked Taylor. He was not prepared to go into the presidency, and he admitted as such in his first address to Congress that he had become president, and I quote, by a painful disp dispension of divine providence. By God alone has this happened. Now, Fillmore kind of got immediately as he assumes office upon Taylor's death on July 9th of 1850, he kind of takes his revenge on Taylor's cabinet, who had kind of urged Taylor to refuse the compromise and had kind of also advised him to keep Fillmore out of the cabinet meetings due to his opposition. He immediately takes his revenge on the cabinet members by dismissing them all. He dismisses all of Taylor's cabinet upon assuming the office, partly as revenge for basically their opposition to the compromise. He then appoints Daniel Webster, the aging Whig leader, as his secretary of state, and thus Webster is a moderate Whig who supports the compromise. He's publicly showing his support that I'm nominating this guy to be in my cabinet because I trust him and I trust his views. Basically identifying that if compromise reaches my desk, I will sign it. It's up to Congress, basically. Now, the, con the compromise eventually did pass Congress that year in September after eloquent arguments from Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas to in, that were argument in favor of it. You may recognize Stephen Douglas as the Democratic senator who basically debated with Abraham Lincoln during his run for the Senate seats in the 1850s. Now, Fillmore publicly called the compromise upon its passing a, and I quote, a means of healing sectional differences between the North and South. Now, unfortunately, the compromise wasn't all that good. Here's what it did as a review. The Compromise of 1850 included the admission of the state of California as a free state without slavery. Washington, D.C., slave trade within Washington, D.C. was abolished. Slavery was still legal in Washington, D.C., but you could no longer buy or sell slaves in Washington, D.C. And New Mexico was granted territory status as part of the deal. And as a, as a peace de la resistance, which wasn't really, it was really kind of the big problem that evolved, was it included a new and more strict fugitive slave law that would allow federal troops to be used to recapture runaway slaves that had run away from their masters. Fillmore actively took part in this last part. He had no qualms. He seen the compromise as necessary to keep the Union together, and thus he did not hesitate to cooperate in slave hunts by sending the army to go help slave catchers find their runaway slaves. And this ticked off a lot of abolitionists in the North, and this ticked off a lot of the people in his own party. 
Southerners didn't like the compromise because they think, thought it didn't go far enough to protect their rights or give them expansion into the West, and they were angry that California had been banned from having slavery. And Northerners were angry because they didn't want to. They felt like the fugitive slave law. They were opposed to slavery, and now they felt that they had no choice. They were being forced to have to help Southerners who to keep up an institution that they hated. And now they could be penalized for it for a federal crime. So it really didn't appease anybody like Fillmore had thought it would. And this is probably the biggest failure of Fillmore's presidency was he thought that the 1850 compromise from the outset, he's like, this is the mending tool I need to help the nation. This is what our country needs to prevent a war, to prevent further sectional violence. When in reality, it did just the opposite. It only intensified the violence. And this is why I said in the very beginning that Fillmore, he didn't, it wasn't that he didn't do nothing. In his case, it was that he miscalculated. He misjudged what was needed. He thought that this was the answer when in reality, it only made things worse. Now, as for the rest of his presidency, which he just simply completes Taylor's term, he did do some other things that were at least a little more successful. One of one of Fillmore's goals was to expand the American economy, and he did this by A, he supported the construction of Transcontinental Railroad, which by the next president will become a whole other problem to deal with as it expands to the West. A Transcontinental Railroad that would connect the West Coast and the East Coast, that would go all the way across the United States. He also signed legislation for the construction of a canal at the Sault Ste. Marie between between Lake Superior and Lake Huron up in Michigan. That little canal that allows ships nowadays to go right from Lake Superior to Lake Huron is vital to trade in the Great Lakes region. Fillmore was the one that authorized the construction of the canal for that by signing the bill that gave it funding. He also restored relations with Mexico what had been damaged since the, war, since the Mexican War in 1846. And he sent Commodore Matthew Perry with a U.S. fleet to open up Japan to American trade in 1853. And this was significant because Japan had been closed off to the outside world for roughly 300 years, since the 1600s. So I should say more about 250 years, we'll say that. Japan had not allowed Westerners really into its borders except for a few small ports where Dutch traders were allowed into Nagasaki. But other than that, they cut themselves enti off entirely from the world. They were isolated. And a lot of nations were already vying for open markets in China to get their, to, you know, have new foreign markets that they could sell their goods and buy new things from the American economy or their own economies. And Fillmore kind of realized that the market in China was becoming a little too crowded. And he, like, realized, well, why don't I try to open up Japan, and I'd be the first one to do it, and I'd probably get more exclusive marketing rights for the Americans that want to go trade over there. So he sends Commodore Matthew Perry over there with a full U.S. fleet of modern, big old battle, not not steel hull battleships, but like cannons, frigates, and this is not stuff that Japan has. <laughs> Japan at this time is still ruled by the emperor. I mean, the emperor is supposedly in charge, but they're still ruled by the shogun and the samurai <laughs> with swords. So when these bit when this big U.S. fleet sails right into Tokyo Harbor, the Japanese are stunned and they're scared because they realize that wow. And then their second reaction is don't shoot. <laughs> Because they realize just how far behind they've gotten behind the world. That they don't even have guns yet. And here's this big old ship lined with them that basically Perry threatened that if Japan refused to open itself up, he would open fire. He kind of used the force of threat to force Japan to open up. Japan, knowing that they would not stand a chance, opens up to the American trade in 1853, ending their isolationism. And Japan very rapidly modernizes during the second half of the 19th century to the point that by 1900 it's pretty much on par with some european nations it develops a full standing army with rifles guns ammunition cannons all all the things of modern war at least at that time and the samurai 
Well, they kind of go for a rebellion where they get their butts handed to them. <laughs> but nonetheless, Japan modernizes as a result of this. It opens up new foreign markets to American trade. So, Fillmore succeeds in this. He also succeeds in settling several maritime claims with Portugal that had dated back to the War of 1812, which pre previous presidents had kind of failed to secure. And as a final thing he did, he also kind of defended the kingdom of Hawaii. Hawaii at this time was still an independent nation, and in 1851, French Emperor Napoleon III basically decided that I might be interested in taking that little island nation. I'd like to incorporate it into the French Empire. Well, Fillmore incited the Monroe Doctrine of President James Monroe, arguing that the U.S. would not stand for further European influence or colonization in any area of the New World, and apparently he considered Hawaii part of it. And he basically told Napoleon that, and I quote, the United States would not stand for any such action, unquote. He made very clear to Napoleon that if you take Hawaii, you risk war with the United States. And this was Napoleon III, not Napoleon I. Napoleon III was the nephew of Napoleon I, Napoleon Bonaparte, who seized power in eight, the late 1840s during a coup. I think it was actually the early 1850s, I'm, I'm correct. That was not different Napoleon, I just want to make that clear. These were now these were accomplishments that Fillmore was actually able to do and didn't actually you know, they weren't a bomb. They were actually somewhat beneficial. But the compromise of eighteen fifty, it was still at home. It's the large domestic problem that everyone is having an issue with and no one is forgetting. Because slavery is still a big debate. Southerners want to expand it, northerners don't want it to expand, and this is causing even more conflict. And when the election of 1852 came, Fillmore was kind of in a tough position. Initially, he wasn't going to run. He wasn't going to run again because Daniel Webster, who had long sought the presidency and at times ran before, he, now he's 70 years old. He wants to you know he wants to do one last run to try. And Fillmore, who was very good friends with Webster, sympathized with his friend and kind of said, OK, I won't run in this election. That way you can try to get be the nominee. Unfortunately, Webster died in 1852. He died, I think, in June. And this meant that he was not going to be able to get the nomination. So then what happens is Fillmore kind of decides, okay, maybe I do need to run because I'm the president now. Maybe I can kind of act as a uniting factor in this untroubled time where the United States is kind of having some conflict within itself. Unfortunately, Fillmore is out of touch with the political situation. He figures that I can be this uniting candidate, not realizing that he had only actually divided the nation by signing the Compromise of 1850. He was not seen as a uniting president. He was seen as someone that had just made the situation worse. And Northerners despised him just as much as Southerners did. And because of this, the Whigs refused to renominate Fillmore in 1852, even though he desired to possibly run again. The compromise, of course, it failed to keep the peace. Southerners and Northerners are still arguing. They're still getting more rambunctious with each other, and it's not coming to an end. And this hurt Fillmore's chances of a re-election campaign, and thus the Whigs didn't even want to renominate him. Unfortunately, it starts to split the Whig Party apart as well along the pro- and anti-slavery lines, because certain members of the Whig Party support slavery, while other ones do not support slavery. And this starts to split even the party apart. Now, when Fillmore leaves office in March of 1853, he refused to join the new Republican Party that eventually comes about. The Whig Party, shortly after the 1852 election, they break apart. They basically collapse and dissolve into their separate little factions that emerge from the slavery debate. Slavery tears that party apart. The anti-slavery faction of the party eventually gets up, dusts itself off, and remolds itself as the new Republican Party. Yes, the Republicans of today, surprisingly, although they stood for a lot different things back then, but the same technical party has now formed in the 1850s. So now we finally have the two modern parties. Fillmore did not want to take part in the Republican Party because it was too anti-slavery for him. He still thought that abolitionism was an agitator of the situation rather than a solver. And 
Fillmore was the last Whig to hold office, and because of that, he is one of his nicknames that he's often been given is the last of the Whigs. Because the party completely collapsed after he left office. In 1856, Fillmore ran on the third uh, on the ticket of the third of the No Nothing Party uh, as a third party candidate during the 1856 presidential election. The No Nothings were a nativist party. They were very much against Catholics, Jews, and immigrants. They did not like those. They were not racist. They weren't against blacks, but they were very much immigrants was a big thing. They did not like immigrants coming into the country, and Fillmore was their presidential nominee in 1856. And part of the reason they got the name of Know Nothing was because whenever one of their members would be questioned on what their party's political beliefs were, they would simply reply, I know nothing. Fillmore only comes in third in the 1856 election, and because of this, he ends up retiring from politics. He considers this the end of his political career. He remarried in 1858 because Abigail had unfortunately died shortly after he left the White House in 1853, and he married a wealthy widow named Caroline McIntosh, and they buy a large home to live in in Buffalo. Now, as the Civil War breaks out in, 18, in the 1860s, Fillmore initially supports Lincoln's efforts to preserve the Union. He did not support Lincoln in the election. He voted for Democrat Stephen Douglas, Northern Democrat Stephen Douglas, because the Democratic Party split apart in that election. But he did not support Lincoln through the vote, as he viewed that the Republicans were, stu were just agitators of the situation. But once the South started to break away, Fillmore did not think they had a right to do that, and thus initially he did support Lincoln's effort for the war. However, he increasingly becomes critical of the Lincoln administration because of Lincoln's policies and the prosecution of the war, such as demanding that slavery will not will be abolished when he, the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, such as when he suspends the writ of habeas corpus as part of the rights that you get when you're arrested. Fillmore doesn't agree with these. And he views that Lincoln has overstepped his bounds, and thus, by the mid-time of the war, by 1863-1864, Fillmore is no longer supportive of Lincoln, because he views that the war should be ended swiftly, with the southern states allowed to rejoin the Union with their slaves intact, to preserve the peace. And thus, because of this, he supports the Democrats in 1864, voting for their presidential candidate, George McClellan, the former general that Lincoln had ousted due to his laziness. Now, of course, Lincoln demolished McClellan in the 1864 presidential election, and Fillmore, because of his vote, was kind of labeled as a copperhead and a traitor by many of the Northerners for basically saying that you are, you are pro-Southern, you're a traitor to the United States, you're a traitor to the Union, you should be hanged, you're not patriotic enough. And this is the label that he got for his actions, for his beliefs. Now, Fillmore did show respect in 1865, he did – when Lincoln's funeral train came through Buffalo, he was one of the leaders of the procession that helped carry Lincoln's casket. And he supported Andrew Johnson's reconstruction plan that occurred after Lincoln's death for the readmittance re of the southern states. Of course, Andrew Johnson's reconstruction plan only lasted about a year before Congress got fed up with it and took control of reconstruction and did it much more radically and much more uh, – aggressively to the South. They were not lenient with the South as Johnson had been. And Fillmore kind of went into obscurity after that point. He eventually died on March 8th of 1874, where he, in Buffalo, of a stroke, and he was buried in Forest Lawn Cemetery in Buffalo with three senators attending his funeral, including former Lincoln, President Lincoln's former vice president, excuse me, Hannibal Hamlin. So that was Millard Fillmore. Now, I understand it's not probably a real long video here. Now, here we just have a small uh, image of basically the debate going on in the Senate during the Compromise of 1850 debate during the time when uh, Fillmore was vice president to President Taylor. And here we have Henry Clay trying to argue for the compromise, and Fillmore is right here in the chair as president of the Senate listening to the debate. Here we have a 1849 picture of Fillmore. 
that basically wraps it up for him. Again, it wasn't that he was a lazy president. He tried to do what he thought was right. But it just so happened that in Fillmore's case, he drastically miscalculated the political situation in the country. And the thing that he thought would help save it only ended up pushing it further towards civil war. So Fillmore, out of those three, out of these, next, out of these three presidents here, him and the next two, he's probably the better out of the two, even though he really failed to do what he set out to do in the first place. But he wasn't, I want to make that clear, it wasn't that he was bad, it's just he miscalculated so badly. The next two presidents, they were just absolutely lazy when it came to what they were going to do, and that's why they're the two worst that we've had down there, you know who. <laughs> but that basically concludes for today. So I'm thinking here on... Later this week here, we're going to try to get these other two in. I, I don't know. I think we might even get Franklin Pearson tomorrow if we're quick enough. So we might be back tomorrow. I think that is going to be our plan. But we're going to cover the next two. Hopefully get both of them done this week. If not, we'll get definitely the one done. And we'll get that last one next week. And then we'll go ahead and do Abraham Lincoln. And then we'll be doing some other topics here. Now, of course, this will be an excellent time getting ready given that we're getting ready to go in some other topics, if anyone has any suggestions or topics they would like to hear about or have some information about, I would probably say this would be a very good time to get those suggestions in if you have any, because I will definitely be taking them into consideration as we're starting to come to the end here of going through this little phase of the presidents. After this, we'll try to do them every one, like spontaneously, just not every single video right in a row. <laughs> but, that basically wraps up for today. So as always, like, subscribe, comments, questions in the and below in the video. And as always, suggestions definitely if you have any. Don't feel don't be afraid to let me know. <laughs> don't be afraid to suggest them. I will I will happily consider them. So that concludes for today. Hope everyone is staying safe and hopefully warm. And I think. I think there's anything else? Nope. Oh, nothing else. So, as always, have a good day, and may God bless you all.